Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva, and we have a great show for you. My God, perseverance pays off. My God, and I don't even mean the book we're going to be talking about in our guest. We have a, a tremendous guest with us who's made the, uh, the trip uh, down from the Boston area to be with us today, uh, Christine Lilly, Olympic gold medalist and World Cup champion. She has a new book uh, co-authored with Dr. John Gillis, Jr. and uh, Dr. Lynette Gillis, and uh, Powerhouse 13, or is Powerhouse, I beg your pardon, 13 Teamwork Tactics That Build Excellence and Unrivaled Success, published by Greenleaf Book Company. Uh, as we said, uh, Christine, a two-time Olympic gold medalist, actually three if you count the other one that she may want, not, not want to talk about, <laughs> World Cup champion two times as well, Christine Lilly and management consultant Dr. John Gillis, along with academic leader Dr. Lynette Gillis, share research-backed principles that helped Christine and her team on the soccer field and explain how those same principles will help you in business and in life. So we welcome to Studio 411, Christine Lilly. I feel like we've been pen pals for several <laughs> years. How are you? I'm wonderful, and I'm so happy we finally have been able to connect Absolutely. on the show. Absolutely. After I was Great. getting a complex. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me now, uh, uh, how did you and the, and the, uh, the Gillis folks, uh, how did you guys hook up to uh, do the book? Right. How did the idea come up? Well, you know, it's, it's one of those stories, and all, like all my stories, they start because of the game of soccer. And uh, we happened to move to Austin, Texas three years ago, or actually it was five years ago, um, and uh, our kids met in school, and then we ended up, uh, John and I ended up coaching our kids' soccer team. And friendship bloomed, and then later off we moved back to the Boston area, and then um, we were sitting around the table when they came to visit talking about the national team and how successful we were and talking about what I do now, speaking about, you know, the game, promotions and all that. And we're like, how, how can we do this? We create a book about all the wonderful things your team did and then you can share it. Um, so that's kind of how it got started and has come to fruitation. And here it is. Well, when I started reading the book, you know, at first I saw that they were involved and I thought, well, this isn't a straight memoir. You know, no, that'll, that'll yeah. be a little bit later on, you know. Yeah, <laughs> we, I need I need the things about my, all my peeps that we there did together. Go, yeah. yeah, so and this isn't just yeah. about me. This is about the team. Exactly, and then I, the more I started looking at it, I said, well, this is kind of like, uh, you know, like a, a business self-help book, you know, mm -hmm. a teamwork self-help book, you know, that that not just for players, but just for regular folks like like the folks watching yeah. today, myself included to kind of maybe uh, work better with people, get along yeah. better with people, and then strive to reach the successes that you guys it, it, it is, and I think what's so great is I've experienced it with the national team, I'm playing on that team for 23 years, and, and having so many wonderful teammates, not only on the field, but off the field, and, and learning from them, and learning what we can accomplish when we come together. And really, all these different tactics are just different things that we did to help our team be successful, whether it's communication, a lot of stuff, it's not, you know, not rewriting what you need to do, but just kind of reiterating what's important. And we truly do care about each other and we enjoy the process of playing and, and winning and obviously the, the lows of losing or any hardships that we went through, but overall came together as a team to, to make things happen. Now you're the second or third person I've had on the show and I, and I said, well, I don't know if I can call her a Connecticut native because you were born for whatever reason, you were born in New York, correct? <laughs> New York yes. City? Whatever reason. No, yes. I'm just saying, yeah. oh, again, yes. you know, was mom at a Broadway show? No, or? we, my parents uh, grew up in New York City. Okay. So I was born in New York City at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. Gotcha. And uh, we lived there uh, a couple years and then I actually moved to California. Oh, okay. For two years, my dad worked for uh, ABC, and we were out there for two years. Then came back to Connecticut in 1976, and then spent okay. my, my yeah. life from kindergarten. So right. Connecticut but, but is my ba home state. Basically, your most of your memories are really rooted in Connecticut. Oh, most definitely. The, yeah. This state has been my home and uh, continues to be my home and supportive, even though I'm up in Massachusetts oh, now. Oh, just, just a it's, short trip away. Yes, it's fabulous. A uh, couple of things uh, uh, regarding like influences in your life, uh, and, and I was curious about this because I read in the book or in some of the notes, you know, um, as a person that came to love soccer at a young age, in those days, you really didn't have, you know, your, your idol was like Pele, you know? Mm -hmm. You probably, I don't know if you go uh, back that far, but you go like watching those, uh, 
you know, North American Soccer League yes. games or whatever, you know, Giorgio Quinaglia yes. and some of those guys. You know. All those names. I, yeah. can, I went to the New York Cosmos game. I remember going to that game as a kid, and it was uh, bag day, and I got a bag, and I thought that was the greatest thing. And that but was the one that they didn't have a roof, right? It was just a round dome stadium? It or, could, uh, that or, part or, I don't remember. They, but they, might have, they might have already moved into the Meadowlands. Yeah, I don't know. if it, this was. I mean, I was probably 10, so this was probably early 80s. Okay. So yeah, I think yeah. I'm not sure, but I, I remember. I mean, because all we saw on TV were male athletes. I mean, my really my um, favorite player in any sport growing up was um, Willie Randolph, second baseman for the Yankees. <laughs> I wanted to be him. That's I was awesome. like, one day I'm going to play for the Yankees, and obviously that didn't happen. But I did get to meet him, and I was like a little kid. I was like, oh my God, this is Willie Randolph. This is the man I looked up to. Um, so it's just great. I mean, I had role models, whether they're male or female. Um, but now young girls have female role models. They have someone that looks like them that they can emulate and want to be like. So I think that's what I've been proud of as well. Do you think that the young girls, let's say, 8 or 10, I mean, what age would a, would a, a girl, a, a, a girl at that point, not a woman, but a young yeah. girl, get in who wants to become like you or, or some of your legendary teammates, what age do you think that they have to really get immersed in playing, you know, or, or working at the at the sport? I mean, mm -hmm. they just can't pick it up at 12 and say, I want to be a soccer player. Well, you know, it's probably harder, but I wouldn't count it out. Okay. I mean, you look at um, our goalie, Brian Scurry. She didn't start playing goalie until she was later, in her t like t maybe 12 around that time. These days with uh, youth sports, it's kind of crazy because they're, they're like, no, really? we're going to start at four. <laughs> you know, and sometimes that, I think maybe it is too young because then you hope at four they're going to want to keep playing when they're 15. You know, we don't want to lose them along sure. the way. So I think, you know, if your kid is showing some interest, and but take it slow. I mean, I have two girls. They're 10 and 7, and my oldest, you know, I think, was five when they started playing. But that's because everyone was doing it. So I was like, sure. okay, well, I can do it. <laughs> yeah. And now my youngest is already starting to play because she's got an older sibling. So, um, but as long as they're having fun, make it a fun atmosphere. They want to keep coming back and playing whatever sport it may be. And mine are into everything, lacrosse, basketball, gymnastics, soccer. And I think that's really important. Now tell us here, uh, obviously at yeah. one of the Olympic games, you and your cronies, and no, they're yeah. not at a toga party. This is the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> so you're on the right, and uh, tell, uh, tell the, the audience. Yeah, we got me over here and Mia Hamm in the middle, and then Julie Foudy on that far side. There you go. And yeah. the, I mean, more reason why I wrote this book because of these teammates because it's what they did for me as a person but also um, what we did together um, was pretty phenomenal on the field but also how we affect lives off the field as well and obviously Mia is a great ambassador of the game and continues to promote and Julie is on TV talking about the game and telling great stories with her podcast she has now so there's all they're still trying to do great things and I think it's awesome now you got started, you grew up in the Wilton area, mm -hmm. uh, Wilton, Connecticut. So again, uh, that, that kind of connection here for you uh, Connecticut and Northeast folks. Um, to me, it just boggles my mind. I mean, the only person I can compare to uh, would be like a Robin Yount with the old Milwaukee Brewers, okay, <laughs> who literally at age 18, and was already in the minors, I think at 17, or no, I beg your pardon, he didn't even go to the minors. He came right out of school at like 17, I think. To, and became a Hall of Fame, you know, outfielder, mm -hmm. shortstop. That's, or, uh, I don't want to go back. There was a guy in the World War II, Joe Nuxhall, who came and pitched uh, two innings or something during World War II when players were scarce at the age of 14. I wow. Mean, that's that's mind-boggling. No, but, it's... But you at 16, and 16. it was not just a walk-on. You were already, like, you know, yeah. on your game. I well. It was uh, pretty crazy. I was a junior in high school. I was 16 years old when uh, Anson Dorrance, the coach of the national team, asked me to join uh, the women's team. And along with myself, Mia Hamm was uh, 15, so Mia was a year wow. younger. Julie Fowdy was 16, and another uh, teammate, Joy Fawcett, was 18. So we were young kids. We were just playing soccer, and then suddenly we were asked to join the U.S. team, and they're like, do you want to go on a trip to China? And I was like, Ugh, i got to ask my parents. <laughs> I can't make this decision. <laughs> there were there were people in music that would have hits, okay, and they couldn't go on tour because they wouldn't allow them uh, either without a chaperone right. or the parents, you know, would say, you're not going on tour. Yeah, well, I mean, my parents were like, yeah, and then I was like, really? You're letting me go? You don't even know any of these people? Um, and I, I just knew Mia briefly from the camp we were at before we got asked, and Julie, very little. And then I was off with a bunch of strangers to another part of the world, and... I was scared, but I knew I loved the game and I was happy playing and 
obviously I was doing something right being asked to join it. I ask this and I try to ask it as sensitive as possible with, because again, you were involved in the Olympics and, and obviously at a young age uh, with, with different leagues and you played mm -hmm. in some overseas leagues at briefly mm -hmm. uh, in between. Uh, a lot of this stuff that's going on the last few years with the Olympics, with, with some of the uh, the scandal, as mm -hmm. I call it, okay, with uh, with uh, Dr. Nasser and, right. and et cetera. Again, did, did you uh, gals ever like experience or have any inkling of any nonsense that was going on? You know, we we didn't fortunately on our um, in our area. Um, I mean, not that I've heard of from anybody, right. and I uh, and it's a blessing. I mean, sure. is what those girls had to go through and and thought was okay it's uh, it's I can't even imagine yeah I mean because so, some, sometimes it becomes like almost deep-seated where you know oh, people people yeah. don't even remember until something comes out and then they go wait a minute you know yeah. they, they've they've mm -hmm. suppressed it to a level uh, whether it's in sports or in real when mm -hmm. I say real life you know non-sports right. activities that all of a sudden they, they they have an epiphany like oh my god you know I, I was a victim yeah. too mm -hmm. so, and yeah. what's great is now people are hearing their voices and getting heard and uh, hopefully Things don't happen like that. Now, oh, um, when did you become aware uh, at a young age that you like Title IX? What's that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you were you were at a conference that I saw on a oh, videotape of that, where you were with a woman that was a big shot at ESPN, okay. and it was about four or five years ago. And there was another lady that she was she was to your left or to your right on the, on the da dais. She was a woman who was like one of the first female sports casters in Sports Illustrated to go into the locker room. Oh, Jack point. McMullen? Yeah, yes, I believe. Yeah, Jack and McMullen. she was actually like harassed and banned at one point. Yeah. And I sat there and I was mesmerized by you guys talking yeah. about all this stuff. And of course, I'm sure you, because yeah. you came along a little later. Well, I think, you know, for Title IX, for a lot of us, uh, I mean, even now we're educating people on it, unfortunately. Um, but a legislation that passed in 72, I was born in 71, so I was a product of Title IX. Um, and um, it, it's taken so long for it to really kick in. And, and it's not just for, um, you know, equal opportunities in sports. It's for a lot of things, educated education. So sometimes sports has such the stronghold on it that we forget there's other balances um, with uh, in school and stuff for the kids. And some of the things are as simple as, if the boys' soccer team is practicing at five o'clock on the main field, and the girls never do, that's what we're talking about. That's mm -hmm. not right, you right. know. So it's these little things like that that we forget. And and for us, there were so many women that came before me, that broke these barriers and fought the fight. And then we're just continuing to remind her that you know, it's equal opportunity for the girls too. We can't uh, forget that. And I think the biggest thing for me now, being a mom of young girls, it's like. It's right in my, you know, in my house. You know, mm -hmm. this is. I want these kids to know that they can try and be anything they want um, and have the same process go through. Something I didn't know, and I'm going to bet you you don't know either. As someone I know who uh, uh, more my age or a little older told me, and I, I looked at them like you're kidding me that they would be, let's say, in gym class, female, mm -hmm. and that if they played basketball, they could only dribble the ball twice, and then they had to pass it. And I'm like. <laughs> what for <laughs> this was the kind of mentality that was going on and and not only yeah. couldn't you play with the boys you, you know but then you're you're concocting these these restrictive rules dribble twice and then have to pass yeah it's so. it's crazy to look at look back and th think that's what it was and i grew up playing with boys because there wasn't girls playing so the, the fact that I could play with the guys, I was like, okay. It didn't, it didn't phase me that there were no girls around. I just was loving what I was doing, baseball, soccer, basketball. Um, but it really is amazing that they thought that girls couldn't do stuff because of that. And it's funny, if we look at the 1991 World Cup in China, our mm -hmm. first World Cup, and they didn't even, even say, state it as the first World Cup. It was like the FIFA m, &M Cup because FIFA didn't know if it was going to work out. They, our games were 80 minutes because they didn't know if we could handle it. But we played game, day off, game, day off, game. So we played three games in five days. Yeah. But, so, but they made it 80 minutes because they think we handled but then throw us three, three games in five days. <laughs> so it's just funny, but uh, That's women are strong. Get, we can, yeah, we the can do The little things that you don't realize. Yeah. Christine Lilly, Soccer Hall of Famer, joining us here for the hour on Studio 411. The book Powerhouse, 13 Team Tactics That Build Excellence and unrivaled success. 
For more information, uh, well, you can go to two websites, christinelily13.com as well as greenleafbookgroup.com. Uh, the number 13, an interesting mm. number that, uh, you know, only a handful of people, and I had to go back, and I know A-Rod and a few, mm. I know in baseball that used to be like a curse, like, you know, no one wears 13. <laughs> yeah. so, I, know, uh, I can't think of any of uh, A-Rod. Steve Nash, uh, uh, 13, I believe. Yeah, basketball. there was there was a couple of others. I'm, I'm blanking. I think there was a guy in hockey. You know, guys that obviously just didn't didn't give it another thought. You know, uh, but how did you happen? To I, mean, come I didn't give it another thought either. And I was a young young g girl on the team, and I got stuck with it. That's it. I got stuck with the number 13, and um, kind of embraced it, and was like, here we go. And 23 years strong. And I noticed that again, and I can understand why. Otherwise, you'll wind up like the New York Yankees. Uh, they in soccer that doesn't seem like they retire a lot of numbers because like the Yankees you'll be wearing number 101 <laughs> soon okay so because I thought well one of one I don't know if you played with this a young person I think you did one year part of one one uh, tournament is now wearing your number on the on the women's national team yes Alex Morgan yeah yeah, yeah. so on the national level I can't uh, retire numbers because whenever you have a a FIFA event or anything, the numbers have to be one through 20. So numbers uh, on the international or US level can't get retired. In college at North Carolina, they have retired numbers. And I actually was number 15 at college. Um, and Anson is the head coach at University of North Carolina and has retired so many numbers that he had asked all the <laughs> players that retired, can we have the numbers back? Yeah. And now <laughs> they put uh, the players wear our numbers, but then they have the name of whoever's worn that number. Very nice. And yeah. I think that's a really kind of cool way. Yeah, I mean, the, it, yeah some Yankees, great players. The Yankees went there. have two number eights because in those days they didn't, re they hadn't re thought of the idea of retiring. So Bill yeah. Dickey, I think it was, and then Yogi Berra. So actually, yeah. ironic two catchers, you know, both with the same numbers. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, University of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I assume you were a uh, uh, scholarship player. I was, and. Uh, Got a, a scholarship there, and I think I was one of three scholarships that they had for soccer. And this was 1989. I went into North Carolina. And at this point, I mean, you you started college at, at the normal age of 17-ish, 18 yes, years whatever, old. Yes, whatever. But by then, you'd already been in one of the first World Cup, and well, you know, yeah, yeah, just so the first World Cup came in '91, so it was two years in school. I was a junior in yeah. college, oh, and I played okay. in that. But I was already traveling. Sure. I mean, we weren't as busy as a team now traveling, but I've already traveled and actually played international games. Um, but loved going to college and playing. I mean, just going from that level and then national level and come back, you're like, oh, you could breathe a little bit. Um, and what was the um, uh, same country, obviously just a different state. What kind of culture shocks did you experience in terms of not only traveling the world, but right. also Going Wilton, Connecticut girl, all of a sudden you're in the backwoods of, you know, you're down in Mayberry, you know, let's uh, go to Mount Pyle, you know. Well, I think for me, it didn't really matter where I was at, and I was really a homebody. I was really homesick. So uh, for the first um, semester, I was a homesick kid, and I, I remember at the end of the semester, I was like, Mom, Dad, do I have to go back? Um, not because I didn't love it, I just was so homesick. But being in the South, I mean, overall, the South, it, the culture of the university, there were so many people from all different areas. So we had that. Um, some Northeasters were up coming south. And, and two, and I remind, you know, the younger people that might see this is that, um, again, you have to remember, there there was no, you know, Twitter. There was no yeah. Instagram. I mean, you know, it was, uh, my wife spent a year in France, and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, it was like, okay, let's let's ring up a $30 yeah. bill for a phone call of like two minutes. <laughs> Talk yeah. fast, because this is costing us a fortune. Yeah. So that's real homesick. It, it, real it, homesick. Was, it was get out the pen and start writing letters. Letters, know? or you get the calling card, so you had to say some money. Oh, you, oh, but no, see, so yeah, yeah, so you were lucky yeah, at least I had you had that. that. Yeah. But it was letters, it was letter home, that whenever you got a package, it was really a high. Now, Here's a here's a cover from uh, yeah. December, I believe, 1999. Uh, let's see. Wherever you want to start, I'll give you 20 seconds. Name every player. <laughs> oh, everyone. Well, Mia Hamm, Saskia Weber, Cindy Parlow, Tiffany Roberts, Tish Venturini, Julie Foudy, Michelle Akers, me, Danielle Fotopoulos, Kate Sobrero, Lori Fair, Shannon McMillan, Carla Overbeck, Tiffany Milbert up top. Um, Brandy Chastain, Tracy Noonan, Joy Fawcett, Brianna Scurry, Christy Pierce, and Sarah Whalen. I'm impressed. We just, okay, so this Amazing. is why, I mean, I know that because these are my teammates, my girls. She practiced and this is, that before she joined. No, but this, this team is really the team that this book has uh, really uh, highlighted. 
and all these players. We just had a reunion two weeks ago in L.A. Nice. First time 20 years since we won the World Cup this year um, in 99, and we had a reunion. And it was so wonderful because such a great group of people. Um, fun. We were laughing all weekend, reminiscing. Now, from your, your second World Cup was, when was it, 06? Uh, no, 1999, so it's 20 years since then. No, 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 your, your second one that you won. 1991, we won the first, and 99, we won the second. Oh, okay, no, no, my bad, okay. Uh, 04 was the Olympics. 04, the Olympics, yeah. okay, so any of the teams, other than perhaps that last year where you were there, you know, kind of almost mm -hmm. in a, a secondary role, any players that are still playing today that, that certainly not that from I this played group. with yes yeah Carly Lloyd yeah um, and Alex Morgan I had okay. a short stint with Megan Rapino okay and I think that might be it okay they're the they're the old ladies and I know the the first two obviously very well known names mm -hmm. I mean in the, both in their right but uh, uh, asked this without offending one or the other but I, I think it was Carly Lloyd and mm -hmm. she's the one that is didn't she win like player of the year? Yeah, like she was two FIFA years? two year FIFA, FIFA player of year. In the twenty fifteen World Cup, um, she scored three goals in fifteen minutes. Yeah. And one of them was like a long like fifth from fifty yards. And so at that when you played with her for what, a, a yeah. year or two? No, we played probably pretty she was in 07 World Cup. Oh, okay. We probably played four years, okay. maybe. So at this point, you're like, you know, 30-something, uh, and she's like, pro how old do you think she was probably she, in well, her teens? Have, well, she's 35 now, and I'm 12. I was 30 in the 07. She's 39 for all, all you writing this down. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> she was in her 20s, let's go say. Oh, and now, really? and now yeah. what's so awesome is she's going into her, I think, her fourth World Cup and she's 37 so she was how old i was when i wow. left so to see her do wonderful things and still competing is awesome one of our uh, one of our folks uh, here at the station you know made mention as we were you know scurrying around getting ready for your arrival and says to me oh you know she's uh, you know the youngest to score a goal and the oldest to mm -hmm. score a goal and i said oh i'm impressed i'm impressed yes i was and then and that leads me to this over here again mm. the christine lily soccer academy now i yes. knew when we started pen palling of several years ago this was basically you were just having the the wilton because you were still in texas yeah. and whatever yeah. and points beyond that now I see that you're also having, what, a second one in the in Mass area? Yeah, yeah, now that I'm living there. Where in Massachusetts? In Medfield in the town I'm living too. Oh, okay. It's real down near Foxborough, okay. so close there. But I've had this, I started Christine Lily Soccer Band in 1995. Wow. And I started doing it when I was playing, obviously. But I w would start doing it, and I would do a week, maybe two, if my schedule permitted, come back to my hometown and teach the kids. And now I've been... So uh, you did that even when you were in Texas, oh, you'd come back? I come yeah, because I remember yeah. you were telling me when we first started communicating, oh, I'm in Texas, and I'm like, well, I'm coming up this way, but then it was tough. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're, so you're I've done it. I think committed. there was one year I missed. I think it was the 99 World Cup Real? year, which oh, I didn't okay, have yeah. time in the summer to do it. So I've been, I mean, 95 till now. It's and you missed years. one uh, one World Cup towards the end. Was it 08 because you're your birth of your first I missed, child? Uh, oh, it was the Olympics. Oh, Olympics, I'm Olympics, sorry. Olympics yeah. and then the 11 World Cup, I retired right before because I was pregnant okay. with my second time. Okay. Uh, tough question. Do you think that, uh, well, let's see, the one in the Olympics, they won that one? They won in 08. Okay, mm -hmm. so then it didn't matter whether you it were there. It didn't matter. <laughs> in, in, in 11, they lost in the finals. And now, do you think that you would have, did you ever have dreams that, look, I came in and like, uh, you know, uh, Bull Durham or uh, what's that guy, the natural Redford came in and uh, scored the winning no, goal? No, I mean, they did. In 11, they did, I mean, play the final, it goes to PK. I mean, they just, it just wasn't their time. I, I mean, now share, I would have loved to share and been there to try to help them win. Share but. with us and correct me if I have the, the, the premise wrong. Uh, I believe it was your, the first one in 99, no, not 99, uh, uh, 91. Mm -hmm. What was the one where you played China and the ball was about to get past your goalie? That was 99. Okay, so kind of give us a, a little bit uh, yes. encapsulated what happened. So... 1999 World Cup, we're hosting it in the U.S. and uh, big stadium. Of the finals is at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. Sellout crowd, 90,000 plus people, about 100 degrees. <laughs> I mean, I can remember, I could feel the heat just talking about it. And we're playing China, and it's going 0-0. Um, zero, zero. We go into overtime, and right before this play, uh, Michelle Akers, who's our dominant player and tallest girl on our team and our strongest header, she gets punched in the head by our goalkeeper on accident, so she's out. And China has a corner kick, and uh, and I'm on, I'm always on the post, and I'm on the post where my left leg is inside the goal, so I can clear it because that's my dominant foot. And the ball served, and the Chinese player outheads our team, 
and heads it on in the goal and it goes past our keeper's hands and I had shift to make the goal smaller and I head the ball off the line. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> save the game. But then what's funny is once I head it, I look and I headed it like inside the six yard box, which is a smaller box uh, on the big penalty box. And there's three Chinese players and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then Brandy Chastain clears it out. And then wow. the funniest thing, I'm walking up the, th uh, we're jogging up the field because we just cleared them next to Julie Foudy, who's one of our captains. And I look at him like, Jules, what the? She goes, Lil, what are you? <laughs> and we were kind of laughing for a second. We're like, let's get out of here. And that um, would have been, that would have been the game. would have been the game. The game would have been over. And we would have lost. Oh. But I'd like to say there's so many moments like that throughout the game that make a difference. And uh, well, you mentioned Michelle Akers. Now, mm -hmm. Michelle, if, if I have the, the person and, and what I read correct, mm -hmm. she she was a gamer. She had a lot, a lot of injuries. Oh, a lot yeah. of yeah. So I mean, and uh, how's she, she doing? I mean, she's she's it, good. She we just, she was at the reunion, so we, I did see her. I mean, Michelle, I think is the best player probably to ever play the game. Like, uh, I mean, she wasn't she voted like I believe uh, player of the of the deck, century. Yeah, she and was. I was surprised at that, not to, to demean her, but I was just like, wait a minute, I, I've heard the name. But I'm thinking with all these other folks, yourself included, I'm like, okay, not no, to mention. No, she, she was pretty unbelievable. She wow. was 5'10". She's dominant in the attack. She's dominant in the defense. Um, technically sound, can score with her head, score with her foot. Uh, she was an amazing, amazing player. And so fortunate that she was uh, on our team and I got there to play for go. so many years. Christine Lilly, soccer a golden girl, Hall of Famer. The book that she's written uh, along with Dr. John Gillis Jr. and uh, Dr. Lynette Gillis, Powerhouse, 13 Teamwork Tactics that Build Excellence and Unrivaled Success. ChristineLilly13.com for more information as well as Greenleaf Book Group, say that three times, dot com. Mm -hmm. um, well, I wanted to ask you too about uh, the thing you talked about with the, the, the header. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, in so many of the major sports, and, and I think one that gets kind of short, uh, you know, shift there is soccer, because again, both men and women, a lot of headbutts. And I mean, has mm -hmm. that been a concern, or that coaches or experts oh, yeah. have talked about? There, you know? there's, a, there's huge um, change in the mentality about heading. Um, they're not starting it until you're about 13 years old that you can head the ball in games because um, of the consequences that can happen. I know Michelle's been through a bunch of. Uh, concussions in her career and sometimes it's not necessarily only that that's the heading it's the hitting heads or hitting your he head on the ground oh absolutely so other, there's other a lot factors, of different yeah. factors but it's really a, a focus on more the health prevalent of among goaltenders or no or, uh, I no. mean anybody really anyone on the field and uh, there's just a lot more attention given to it which is great because any any player that has been through uh, concussions and have had issues um, really are prevalent saying you know it's not worth it <laughs> Because in the end, your health is probably the, is not probably their health is the most important thing. I found this, and I said I have to ask her about this. Uh, the, either she's dressing up for Halloween like this, or <laughs> there's there's a story behind this. Christine Lilly, if I had an echo chamber emulator. Okay, what is emulator, this? Emulator. Yes. Is this, is this a nickname you had? So or, uh, cool. What? No, I, I kind of like my little <laughs> outfit there, to be honest with you. So uh, FIFA, who is the governing body of you, uh, soccer for the world. Um, this year for the, the Women's World Cup, they have 23 legend soccer players, male and female, that have created into superheroes. So I'm the emulator. I can transfer my powers to others and do all these wonderful Which things. Which is why she's running camps. There you right. go. Yes, yes. So the funny thing is I told my kids about this. I'm like, I'm going to be a superhero. And they're like, emulator? What's that? <laughs> I was like, well, I get to transfer all these great powers I have to others and help them. And then I get to stand here and, you know, um, but it's kind of a cool way that the, the FIFA is trying to connect, sure. bringing the men's side in to promote the women's ga the, the game of soccer and the World Cup, and uh, it's really cool. Uh, we'll use a couple of other big words. These come from uh, the book Powerhouse. Uh, tr uh, transform, empower, mm -hmm. achieve, and motivate. Those yeah. are like the four that I took out of the four yeah. core values or points that mm -hmm. you guys, you and the uh, the good doctor uh, and the the, uh, the other doctor, the doctors, doctors Dr. The Gillis's, doctors. Uh, want to impart. So yeah. talk us a little bit. We'll start with transform. Yeah, so we took, obviously took the word team and created four pillows for our book. And transform, you know, you want you have to create a team and transform it. So, that, you know, there's three chapters in that, selecting your team, setting goals, setting direction. Um, so you have to take in people and create what you're shooting for. And then um, you go to empower. So you're trying to empower 
all of the people on your team in any way you can, and that's through the leadership, the foundation that you set, um, and giving us the empowerment to try to accomplish the goal set for us, and then achieve. I mean, that says in itself, <laughs> we're trying to make it all happen through communication, all these wonderful things that are gonna help you try uh, to achieve work together um, and achieve the goal set at hand. And the last one is to motivate. Um, and if you combine all those with our chapters and it, it really creates the core of what you, what you are as an individual and what your team should be. And, and the motivate part, which is great, is a lot more talk about chemistry. Um, and you know your purpose and trying to figure out as a group how we can achieve that through all that but what's interesting there's 13 chapters and the last chapter is doing the right thing which is the underlining theme of the book but also of what we did on the national team everything we did playing wise we wanted to do what was right yeah. you know and we did our we're fighting off the field for our rights as well but on the field you know you play an integrity of the you know the game the rules of the game you do what's right you know if the players not not getting treated the same way, you're going to stand up for them and, and, and fight for them. So I think that's what's great about the 13 chapters, the overall theme. Something it might have been covered in the book as well, but uh, I, I know read up on uh, some of your, your adventures and comparisons to other teams. And of course, I came up with a few that probably you would agree that uh, equal in terms of like what you and your, your uh, teammates uh, tried to do and continue mm -hmm. to do uh, throughout the years like the, uh, you know, the Yukon women's program, mm -hmm. the Chicago Bulls of the mm -hmm. uh, mid nineties through the uh, early to mid aughts. Um, I know you or someone mentioned like the Yankees, again, mm -hmm. in various spurts, I think, you know, more the old, the old right. style Yankees. Uh, the difference being is that in many cases, those teams are obviously getting paid, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's this whole thing with the discrepancy between mm -hmm. male and female pay and I think you mentioned or in the book I saw that obviously, you know, the season may be shorter. Like someone says to me, why is in the uh, WNBA, you know, they're not getting paid. I think the average salary is like 115,000, but some are lucky if they make 75,000. Oh, yeah, 000. exactly. Meanwhile, a marginal player in the NBA, I looked it up, is probably making 7.5 million. So, I mean, we're talking, you know, crazy yeah. numbers, but it has to do with sponsors. It has to do with viewerships. TV rights, you know, all, yeah. And uh, when you, um, in between being on the uh, the U.S. women's team, they tried starting some professional leagues, mm -hmm. and uh, they talked, I think, in the book too about how, you know, in some cases, some of these leagues they start with too many teams and too much expectations, mm -hmm. whether others started smaller mm -hmm. or they need the backing of the parent club, yeah. the NBA, MLB, NFL. Yeah. I mean, we just had a, another another competitive football league or so they wanted to be mm -hmm. that folded in like game eight I mean it's just it's crazy you know, yeah. now people are out of work people are saying where what yeah. happened what happened well I think you know it's interesting when you talk about when you you see the women's sports in the limelight now because we're at the early stages of a lot of them I mean the WNBA has been around for the longest right now and if you look at a lot of the men's leagues that before the NFL was at there was two leagues and the struggle that went on for all these leagues before they became what they are now. Right, yeah. So it's, to me, it's, it's a process and a learning process, obviously. We're always comparing to the men's side because that's all we have to compare with, but it's like apples to oranges. You can't, I mean, where the levels are, the leagues are so different from where the women's are. But in the NWSL right now, the women's pro league is on the seventh <coughs> year. I believe it's the seventh year and going strong. So that's exciting for, for myself after I've been part of two leagues that didn't make it. So happy to hear that and, and the, the investors that are uh, supporting that and sponsorship and TV coverage. Because all that stuff, it's always like, well, you're not getting this, but I'm like, but you're not marketing. You know, so it's right. which comes first. And exactly. for us, it's you got to put the dollars in the marketing to help get the revenue turn on the other side. So there's always like that, well, or even like here in Hartford now, they have, you know, like a new league that, that started with, you know, a men's team. And mm -hmm. again, it's up in yeah. the air whether they're going to survive. And yeah. there's so many factors that are, I'm no expert at that. But again, it's just, yeah. it's uh, it's really a hit or miss. Unfortunately, more, it's like businesses. You know, they say, well, better than 50% of businesses fail. And there's, 
you yeah. know, some of it, uh, there, are, there are reasons, you know, but unfortunately mm -hmm. you can't always teach that. You know? Right. Um, when you were a kid, let's say we'll start with eight or ten, mm -hmm. what, did, what did you want to be when you grew up? I mean, do you have like other than Willie Randolph's uh, replacement <laughs> at second base? Oh, shoot. When I was a kid, I can remember, I just remember watching the Olympics and the only big dream I had besides playing second base for the Yankees uh, was to be in the Olympics. And I think every kid. I mean, you watched it on TV and it was just so amazing. And I remember watching... I don't know what year, but Nadi Komanich um, compete 84, 84 yes, I yeah, think it yeah, was. The, and yeah, I just was like, LA oh, yes, I was like, oh, my gosh, she's unbelievable. And I thought maybe one day gymnastics Olympics. And then I realized I couldn't do a back walkover. So I'm like, gymnastics isn't going to work. So I always had that vision and that dream to be in the Olympics. And then obviously came to fruitation in 1996. And soccer, that was the first soccer Olympics. So I didn't even see soccer in the Olympics until I was there, there <laughs> so it's kind of yeah. interesting. But if you follow your dreams and follow your passion of what you love. Always believe, as she said. Always right? believe, yeah. you are so correct, you Larry. Go. That is right, spot uh, on. I have to ask you, this gentleman yeah. here, a Connecticut uh, yeah. a resident, if not a Connecticut native, Tony yeah. DeChico, yeah. was the U.S. Uh, women's national team head coach, 94 to 99, World Cup champion, Olympic champion, National Soccer Hall of Fame champion. Mm -hmm. Um, we lost him uh, back in, was it 2017? Uh, tell me, share, share for the folks who might know Tony or follow Tony, um, what a wonderful man. Um, and he was our coach through the 99, actually 95 to 99, and uh, kind of our father figure, our, our leader, um, and really set the foundation of what our team was all about um, during that time. And not only did he love the game, he loved the people involved. And it wasn't just the team he loved, but he, any interaction he had with anyone, he gave them their full attention. Um, you know, he's left behind his wife and uh, four sons. He had all boys, and then he had a team of 20, 20 women that he coached. I saw one of his sons did, uh, like, the induction, I guess, when yeah, he was inducted yeah. into the Hall of Fame, and I thought that was great. Yeah, you know, and, he, and one of his son's wife just had a, a little baby, so they have a little grand, a grandson, I think he is. So what a wonderful family he has. He was a family man, but he also treated the team like a family and really added so much to our team when he took over 95 for Anson. Um, and every day he would come out to practice, he'd stand on the field and be like, I love my job. And we're like, okay, Tony, we get it. <laughs> but he truly did. He loved everything about it. He loved us. He loved the game, and, and especially the women's game. He dedicated his time um, to the women's game, and, and we're forever share, grateful. Share a little bit, uh, because I don't want to leave uh, this individual out. Your coach, when you were in uh, University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. then was either mm -hmm. your first or second coach on the women's national mm -hmm. team. Uh, yeah, talk a little bit. so Anson was first my coach with the national team because I was 16 when I made the national team. And he was the, he was the second coach to coach the national team, but really the first that competitively. Yeah. Um, so I knew Anson from the national team, and then I attended the University of North Carolina, uh, where I played four years for him. And he, that man changed my life. He basically did it. When he asked me to join the national team, changed my life. Um, and then I became a part of a program in North Carolina that was by far one of the And I got the impression story. that program for a brief time was kind of like, again, to draw a comparison, like Pat Summit's Tennessee or Geno's UConn. Mm -hmm. It was like he had like one, one star after another on those clubs. Oh, yeah. He's, he got the top recruit. And, I mean, he's won 22 national championships or wow. 17 out of 22. Some crazy number. I won all four when I was at school. So back in the 80s to the 90s, I think we lost in 85 and 95 were the only two times we lost a championship. No, you mentioned that. I'll ask what, uh, besides your family, et cetera, et cetera, as far as playing, what's your greatest accomplishment? Do I have to pick just one? Well, I'm just saying, because you mentioned the four at the University of North yeah, Carolina. Yeah, you know, I, I think for me, the longevity I had playing soccer, I mean, at, at North Carolina, obviously the four years, but the longevity on the national team, 23 years I played. and. And I have the record for most caps, 354. Um, so obviously I was doing something right. Now say again, because I, I made a note. A lot of folks don't know no. what caps mean. Now that's right. what, international games? Yes, a cap okay. means you play for your country, an international game. Whether you play one minute, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, if you step on the field, you get a cap. You hold a record. And I have the record out of everyone in the entire world. And they used to give you a cap. That's why they got the okay, name. So it's an international it. game, and they give you a cap. So I hold that. So just the fact that I was able to contribute at that level for so long 
is something I'm really proud of. But I also got to play with so many great players. Oh, absolutely. So many great players. Another photo of Tony, and yeah. if you would, from left to right, you're second from left. Yeah. Uh, tell you the folks. You got Mia Hamm over here, then myself, Tony, Julie Foudy, and Christy Pierce. Oh. And uh, those are all on the 99 team, and that was part of our promotion, starting our promotions for this big World Cup to s sell it out. There and you go. some bad hairdos. <laughs> 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 or clothes, too. I don't know what you, what you want. Which one, where do I go there? Yeah, but that's like when yeah. I watch, let's say, you know, uh, uh, the NCAA, the, the, yeah. the women's game, you know. You, you see the, the the ladies, you know, uh, when they're at a banquet or an event, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, like they just had the... Uh, the draft, you know, uh, yeah. uh, one year a Kia nurse and Gabby Williams and uh, 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 Ms. Samuelson and uh, Ms. Uh, Nafisa Collier, and you're like, who kidnapped the other girls? I mean, <laughs> it's like they, they don't, they, they look fabulous. I mean, because yeah. again, they're, when you're working, you know, you're, yeah, not, you're you don't, not supposed to look And your like hair that. is always up, and or <laughs> exactly. it's never, you don't always look that way, or you don't always look in the field, so. Oh, but great bad. people there, and Tony's oh, yeah. quality. Notice Tony had more dark hair, you know what I'm saying? That's the, he, start, he started uh, turning gray trying to shape these ladies up. <laughs> <laughs> he was a man of uh, you know, a lot of principles, and I'm wow. sure and, uh, just a ni nice shot, nice it was shot. great. Uh, tell me, um, you were at the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the 96 Atlanta Olympics, yes. okay? And I had to ask because I can remember as if it was yesterday, and a guest on the show, a gentleman, a sports writer, PR guy named Marty Appel, was mm -hmm. heavily involved with the, with the Olympics uh, in terms of organizing and running it because it was held in the U.S. But uh, the Atlanta experience with all the craziness that went on, where there was uh, an explosion mm -hmm. that went on there, again, any thoughts, any, like, where were you when that happened? Yeah, with you know, um, in the 96, I was our first Olympics for soccer, so we were ecstatic just to... Uh, be a part of it and uh, we got to for soccer it usually starts before sometimes before the Olympic opening ceremonies because it's so long so we have to play games the quarterfinals semis and that so we had uh, we didn't start before uh, the opening ceremonies but we got to go to the opening ceremonies but our soccer venues were not in Atlanta so we were in uh, where were we we were in Miami, and then the finals were in uh, Athens, Georgia. So we never were in the city, uh, in Atlanta itself, except for the opening ceremonies, which we went to. And then when that occurred, the bombing occurred, um, it was like lockdown. And I think we were kind of near, um, I think more closer to Atlanta than right there. Mm. And I remember that, like, you, you guys can't go anywhere. And wow. that's all you remember. And, and this is back in the day. There's no, what we had was... Um, Transistor radio? <laughs> no, like the little pager. Pagers, oh. well. so we could get notes from our family on it, and then we thought those were the coolest things ever. So, and then cell phones, we didn't have yet. So yeah. you would call from your room, and just trying to let people know that we were fine. But um, it was a little bit of, we were like, oh my gosh, that's weird. Um, but we weren't really centralized. But they did have lockdown. We had our own security that traveled with us, and then, uh, and we felt pretty safe though. The book Powerhouse, Teamwork 13, Teamwork Tactics that Build Excellence and Unrivaled Success. Our guest, uh, Hall of Fame soccer star, uh, 23 years on the uh, on the national team. Christine Lilly joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. Uh, the uh, website's uh, www.greenleafbookgroup.com. And also Christine Lilly, Christine Lilly, he tried to say 13. Dot com for more information. Uh, going back to the book a minute, in the book you talk about the green and the gray tactic yeah. is referred to. to. Fill me in in the yeah. audience on that. Well, green and gray, I kind of think it sums it up. Green, you're fresh and young. Gray, you're a veteran towards the end of uh, your career or end of any career, your sports career or your business career. And I think uh, it's important to have both of those. And I think we all go in being green and fresh and ready to go and learning from the graying. Um, people and I got the experience being a green player with likes of Michelle Akers, April Heinrichs and for me I, I was just t taking it all in as that you want to take it all in you want to feel it because you have a you have a vulnerability to you because you don't know what to expect so you're like oh and you got that little like edge to you too because you haven't been a part of um, necessarily uh, many things but the interesting part when I was greening on the team everything was new to all of us because we didn't have a World Cup we didn't have the Olympics so we we're all experiencing first but I was taking in everything and kind of being a rookie um, and learning the ropes and then as I get to my end of my career you're taking all that knowledge that you learn throughout and then trying to then give back to those new young players coming in and uh, it's a 
it's great to have a balance of both and I think in every any organization it's 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 a powerful thing if you have too many greens they're not going to know the you know the comfort or the confidence when things get rough because they haven't been through it all so you need those grays and then I think too many grays they're not gonna be able to move <laughs> you know we may be really smart but their, their, their legs aren't gonna be moving those young fresh ones coming in oh, um, but it's a, it's great and I think we all experience both both of those throughout our, our careers whatever career it may be more uh, more tough questions for you yeah. okay best player as a teammate just one I have to pick one best yeah, player as a yes, team. Oh my gosh. <laughs> in other Very, words, yeah, I'm gonna, li you know life what? and death out on the field. Yeah. Who in your 23 years was, was like, boom, always there? Always there. You know, could even be a player that wasn't like a star, or might be a secondary, someone that you just said, you know what? Always had, always was there, always had my back, was always in the right place when I needed it. Well, I, that's everyone. That's what this book's about. <laughs> we have these teammates. That's why you can't, I can't do anything alone. Oh, okay, I So you it. have all these teammates that were there, and I think that's Let what made Let me rephrase us. that. The player that, to the, that you played with the longest. Oh, the longest. I mean, that was all, Mia, Julie, they, everyone had each other's back. Um, Michelle Akers, everyone had. So you can't trip her up. She's going to, like, stick with that yeah, team I can't, concept. It is. There isn't one player. I mean, I think if you look at one or one situation, my family always had my back. They always were there. So. Player that got the most out of their abilities. Oh, did you, just asking for one? Yes. This is tough. Yeah. This is no, tough. no, I don't mean because, again, that's usually a, a player that's more of like um, what they would call in baseball, like a, a, a utility fringe player, a utility. Friend, yeah, yeah. There's no knock on that. It's somebody that, in other words, you know, uh, uh, exceeded you know, their potential, like someone who was like uh, in, in football, like a 99th draft, you know, 99th selection, and yeah. they wind up being this player that just like you say, my God, this person just evolved before our very eyes. Yeah, I mean, that's another tough one. Because <laughs> we all evolved, we all got better, shoot. Um, but ours is so tough. I mean, well, if you look at the 99 team, we had 20 players on that roster. There's probably four or five that never played a minute uh, on the field. One of the Daniel Fotopoulos. And she would be the first one to give you a high five when you stepped off the field. She'd be the first one at practice pushing you to be better and never. So that's what I mean. In, in other words, it's not necessarily always on the field, but yeah. in other words, you know, like in baseball, for instance, yeah. uh, it used to be a guy when you were a kid, you know, Charlie Lau. He was a, a guy who was barely a 200 hitter, mm -hmm. became a guru in hitting, okay, and he passed away of cancer years later. Point was, this guy, you would have thought he was Ted Williams, but he could impart hitting. Mm -hmm. Williams couldn't impart hitting like Charlie Lau mm -hmm. could because why they had in things that came out in them later on that made them yeah. superior in not as a player but in terms of teaching, teaching the game yeah. and that's yeah. like I mean yeah you know. like well Danielle she just was a great teammate and um, really to know that you may not step on the field and still giving everything you have to help your team be successful is one of the unselfish thing and why. And now, uh, what works. about like the uh, like backup goalie? The backup mm -hmm. goalie uh, at various times during your career, do they a lot of times don't see any action? Oh yeah, the two goalies. We had two backups in the 9-9 team that didn't step on the field. But and I mean, like what if it's a, uh, you know, an eight nothing route? I mean, there's no mercy <laughs> rule. So I mean, do they say, well, put somebody in because that could be dangerous because then somebody could start hammering the goal. The next thing you know, oh, well, it's like eight to seven. It, it is. I mean, when you're playing a World Cup, it doesn't happen often. But even you only have a certain amount of subs as well in soccer. So it doesn't limit okay. that kind of movement. But they in friendlies, we call friendlies practice games leading up to sometimes they play the keeper in you know, the last 20 minutes. So in other words, the third string goaltender like in football, if you were the third string quarterback, if you're not announced before the game, you can't come in unless there's a catastrophe. Well, no, you're, I mean, you're on the roster, you could get in, but you're probably, the, you're the last Okay, option. gotcha, yeah. Because yeah. there's a goalie before you. And, yeah. yeah, like the backup, the, the third so they, string catcher, you know, that's yeah, a case somebody. But like they're that. important, you need them. Of course them. they are, You yeah, need them, and exactly. I think that's what's so important about the whole team Best, dynamic. Here's one that you don't have to offend any of the gals. Okay. Best player on an opposing team. Uh, well, I know there was a young woman from China that I'm not yeah, familiar Soon with. Yeah, Win, China. We have Marta from Brazil. Um, Dagny Milgram from Norway. Now, why do the, the folks in Brazil? They only they're like Ichiro. They only have one name. Is that like a yeah, that a shtick that they have? That's, I don't know. We got like we, we got, just call Christine and Abby. Well, and yeah, they, we got Madonna and Gaga, <laughs> whatever. Jordan, um, but yeah, there's a couple Marta from Brazil and Soon Win from China. 
Um, now, who's out there now that you know you keep you you keep tabs on uh, you know like the game as much as you can? Yeah, I mean Sam Kerr, this girl from Australia. Um, she plays in our pro league. She's been one of the top goal scorers. Who's who's really good. Marta's still in the mix uh, for Brazil. Um, and then some names I can't pronounce that are all out there. And now I'm getting older, so these old players are so young, I don't, I have to stay in yeah, tune sure. to everything. But each team obviously has one or two players that are their personalities, and obviously their whole team's great, but the ones that they really focus on. Now, let's see, uh, a, a story again that I got, I believe, from the book, uh, University of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. you, you score a goal, you're like, you know, obviously very young, and all of a sudden the coach takes you out of the game and you're like, yeah. what, the, what the H is going yeah. on here? So all of a sudden explain to the, you know, the yeah. young folks and the so budding soccer players, what was the, the, the uh, right. mental, uh, the, the uh, madness going on in his head? What was the, the purpose he was trying to convey? Yeah, to um, first of all, you're doing a good job reading the book. Yeah, and considering knows. I did it all in one day. In one day. <laughs> See, look at this, you can get through it. <laughs> Um, my, my wife would be proud, the Danielle Steele lover. Yeah, day. well, uh, that's <laughs> awesome. So anyway, so I was, I don't know what year in college I was, um, maybe my sophomore or junior, I don't know. We were playing a, um, a small-sided 7v7 tournament in, at William & Mary in the spring. So it's our spring season. And we're in the playing the game. I get the ball, and it's kind of a breakaway. And I, I go in, and the, um, I shoot it low, and I score. And I was all excited, and we come back, and we're getting there, and then I get subbed out. I'm like, what the, why am I getting, what the, why am I getting subbed out? So as I get off, Anson says, come on over here. And he pulls me over, and he talks to me. He goes, did you see what you just did? And I was like, yeah, I just scored a goal. He's like, no, did you see how you did that? I was like, well, I shot it low. He's like, yes, the keeper stayed up. You shot it low, and you scored. It was perfect. And I was like, okay, thanks. And then he put me back in. And during the process of all that, I'm like, okay, great, coach, thanks. Now, years back, I go back to the story so much because it, it, it stayed in my mind because he was recognizing something I did well and giving that confidence and reminding me that these are the things. It wasn't like to pulling me out when I already know I messed up, you know, and, and being a negative comment, it was a positive comment. And, and it showed on still how technical things can be. Like if a goal is up, you're down. There's, there's rules of thumbs that you need to know in the game of soccer. And um, it showed that I had learned them. And, and I, executed. I have to read this quote. This is someone who I don't know if the coach would be calling him out of a game to give him a tip. <laughs> but uh, Christy Lilly and I sh uh, share sustained careers with teams who have consistently achieved hers at the World Cup and Olympic and mine at the Super Bowl. While individuals focus on their own peak performance, a champion caliber team needs high performing teamwork. If you didn't already know why the U.S. women's national soccer team consistently wins, you will after reading this book. Tom Brady multiple 39 <laughs> times Super Bowl winner New England Patriots but but you tell that story uh, sometime to Tom and see if Bill Belichick is pulling uh, him out of the well game. I bet you somewhere along the way someone has pulled him aside well, and, he, and I no didn't doubt. know this uh, I don't know that you do uh, uh, he went to Michigan yep I know that and all of a sudden he had uh, Drew Henson who later tried playing ball with the Yankees and, mm -hmm. and went to the Cowboys and didn't do well at all nice man I understand got hurt and then there's Tom's break, and Drew never, never had another chance. Yeah, well, oh, that's, yeah. I mean, Tom Brady, what a, a stud he is yeah. in the uh, New England Patriots. There you go. Even though I'm a New York Jets fan. But oh, we well, love likewise, him. there we but go. But I lived in right. Boston for so long, I mean, yeah, how do you he, not love him? You he, just say you like him all He's the just awesome. Well, we have to do this again sometime. So we're going to, we're going to, uh, next time, uh, whether it's via, you know, whatever, landline or uh, satellite feed, whatever, it's been, been uh, an honor and a privilege to have you here. We love the book, Powerhouse, 13 Teamwork Tactics that Build Excellence and Unrivaled Success. Christine Lilly, along with Drs. John Gillis Jr. and Dr. Lynette Gillis, uh, published by GreenleafBookGroup.com. You can also go to ChristineLilly13.com for more information. And again, I uh, love it. Thank you. We, we finally did Your it. Your joy, you. absolutely. Appreciate All right, it. and we thank you folks for joining us here on Studio 411 today. Larry De Silva is my name. We look forward to seeing you again real soon. Take care.